Church and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Thank you for coming to spend your Sunday afternoon with us. Um, uh, we will do um, an update on the West Falls Church economic development piece. My, my piece on that is going to be pretty short. I think the main emphasis for today is to uh, get a, uh, a look at the schematic drawings for the, uh, for the new high school and Peter will le lead us through those. We have the architecture team which Peter will will introduce in just a moment. Um, just a, a word uh, that I'll say just um, in terms of our meeting. Uh, we are broadcasting all of the Sunday series meetings. So we, uh, if you have a question, we ask that you ask for the microphone so that we can brought, so that your question is, is captured uh, for, for this meeting so people watching at home can. Uh, and if I forget to do that, remind me that I need to get a microphone. Um, Mayor Tarter, would you like to make any welcoming remarks for us? Not really. I guess. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, so that's 0 for 1 so far. Um, we are also uh, joined by several council members, and Dr. Noon will also introduce the school board members who are here, but Vice Mayor Mary Beth Connolly is here, uh, Letty Hardy is here, uh, Council Member Phil Duncan is here, um, and uh, thanks everybody for being here. Um, Dr. Noon, do you want to introduce the school board members? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Really glad you're here. Um, we'll start with the, our board chair, Lawrence Webb, is here. Sitting next to him is Greg Anderson, school board member. Uh, Aaron Gill is here. Um, and that's it. <laughs> I think that's it, right, for today? Did I miss anybody? No, he's got a mic. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Well, welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for being here. All right. So I'm going to go just through a few slides just to provide some background on the, uh, on the West Falls Church uh, development. Um, but first, let me just note, as the mayor noted, we do have a commitment through this process. And, and this is uh, probably the most important thing that's happening in the city right now is the planning of the high school and uh, planning for the 10 acres of economic development that will help lower the cost of that high school for our taxpayers. So we've been having a series. We call it the Sunday Series since last January. Uh, November 18th, of course, is today. We've got additional ones scheduled, generally with the third Sunday of the month. And that gets us into the holiday season in December. So we'll have an announcement on the date uh, that we'll do for December uh, shortly. Um, so I'm talking about economic development. And sort of one of the first threshold questions is, why would the city be taking 10 acres of land that's currently owned by the school board and used for the high school uh, to, to market for, for economic development. And this was discussed extensively through the referendum that was approved by the voters in November a year ago. Uh, but we're planning to issue $120 million in debt uh, for the high school. Um, we're planning to amortize that over 30 years. And with the interest rate assumptions that are shown there, that'll be about $6 million a year of annual debt service for 30 years for this high school. That's about 15 cents on the tax rate. And so uh, we're working very hard uh, to try to create value on that site, which is an extremely well-located piece of real estate, to generate value, um, to create a great place, and to have a, a quality of development that will complement the school and be something we can all be proud of and also help us lower the cost um, of, of this uh, new state-of-the-art high school. So we've had a process here. This slide, didn't, I think, didn't convert over to Apple uh, perfectly, uh, PC, <laughs> Mac uh, battles. Uh, but we've had two processes that have run concurrently. The school board has overseen the contracting for, this, for the new high school, and Dr. Noon will talk about that in just a moment. And the city council has overseen uh, the land development. It's included uh, updating the comprehensive plan, issuing a request for proposals last March for economic development, uh, we got six proposals from that, um, and then issuing a request for detailed proposals in June uh, to the top ranked of those. And now we're working very hard to select a development partner. On the agenda for Monday night for the City Council is action to choose the top ranked developer. And we're still working right now to ensure 
that the city gets the best possible deal through that transaction uh, to protect the city's long-term financial interests and also to accomplish all the goals that were articulated in that request for detailed proposals that was developed with a lot of really useful and meaningful community input. Our goal then, um, if that selection is made on Monday night, then we'll have six months to work through two things. One, a comprehensive agreement that will lay out all of the, the uh, transaction terms um, and a land use entitlement, uh, grant the zoning necessary for the developer to actually to build on the 10 acre site. Also in May is when the, the schools would finalize the design for the high school and in June we would issue the debt for the George Mason High School. The intent has always been to only issue the debt after we've actually executed a comprehensive agreement for the economic development to help pay for that debt. Um, then we have two years of construction for the high school and then we have the grand opening of the high school and everybody moves into it and the existing uh, George Mason High School is a vacant building and the developer then takes possession of that of that land. That's the overall schedule and that was discussed. That's, this is really the plan that was discussed during the referendum in uh, November 2017. So those are the dates that I just uh, um, mentioned. Uh, we did receive two proposals uh, and those executive summaries are posted on the city's webpage. I'll provide just a little bit of an overview. Um, one of the teams is the team of EYA, PN Hoffman, and Regency. Regency being the retail, PN Hoffman being uh, the, the commercial office, and EYA being the, uh, the residential piece of it. Uh, so they propose um, a project that has a retail street that flows this way, but with tie-ins to the high school uh, through pedestrian ways, as well as a street and a tie-in to uh, the federal realty property across from Haycock Road. Um, some of the details of their proposal uh, is that it would be anchored with a grocery store, um, uh, a lot of sort of food-oriented retail, approximately 390 square feet of, uh, of commercial office space, a hotel that would be uh, designed in tandem with civic space, and the civic space is intended to be uh, in this location, close to the school, so that uses there can, uh, can complement school activities. Um, approximately 288 multifamily apartments, uh, 245 condos, uh, affordable housing, uh, senior housing, and, uh, and public space uh, in, in that promenade that was shown in, in the last slide. So that's the EYA uh, proposal that's under consideration. Rushmark, this is the image that they provided in their executive summary, which is the public image. Um, they have a similar program. Um, theirs, uh, they put in an uh, unsolicited proposal to Virginia Tech, and they have a tie-in with Virginia Tech. Um, since then, uh, the EYA team has also put in a proposal for joint development with Virginia Tech. Uh, Rushmark's pr uh, program uh, is 148,000 square feet of retail space with a with a grocer as well, and a, a, a large format gym. Uh, 151,000 square feet of, of office, a hotel, approximately 750 apartments, uh, condos, affordable housing, and that park that I mentioned is about three quarters of an acre in size. So uh, the city council uh, has been working uh, to hear the recommendation of the evaluation committee. The evaluation committee represented, uh, had representation from the school board, the planning commission, the economic development authority, uh, the city council, staff, and independent commercial real estate experts that have been advising the city throughout this transaction. There are really three big buckets for our evaluation. Number one is the value to the city, and in that we're looking at the uh, short term, well, what is the transaction value? and also what is the fiscal impact, what is the long-term value to the city. We're looking at the quality of the development program, what types of uses, their design, um, all the things that were laid out in the RFP uh, that, uh, that we developed, and then an evaluation of their execution risk. Um, the city will be issuing uh, significant debt. We want a partner that is going to perform, and so we've asked for all of their numbers, all their financials, their pro forma, so that we can assess their ability to, to, uh, to execute what they're saying they're going to do.
So um, if the council takes action on Monday night, um, some of the key things that will be happening, uh, we anticipate that we'll, in December or very soon after the Thanksgiving holiday, um, have public hearings with that developer so we can really start to uh, get their plans out to the public so that people are well informed and can comment on it. In January, we uh, anticipate that we'll get a formal land use application. That would be referred to boards and commissions in February, and we'll work towards uh, May of execution of a comprehensive agreement and, um, and action on the land use applications that are submitted. The one thing that I will say is we've broken this into two chunks. So there's two approvals. This land use approval will be at the conceptual level. Then in the two years while the high school is being built, there'll be a more detailed site plan approval uh, that will have all the board commission review, planning commission recommendation, and ultimately will come back to city council for its approval as well. And throughout this whole development process, we'll work very closely with the school board as a key stakeholder and adjacent stakeholder uh, for, the, for this development. So that's really the update that I have. Um, uh, we are looking forward to the, the economic development piece of this becoming a much more public process. So far, the City Council, the Evaluation Committee have been working really hard to try to get the best base terms that will set the stage for a successful project. Um, and and uh, after that happens, then we'll go through a much more public process that we're familiar with uh, to get us towards um, the May actions that I described. So uh, let me stop there just to see if there are any questions for me, and then we're going to turn it over really to the main event of today, which is to discuss the high school. Thank you. I was just wondering during this time, have you had the opportunity to go back us with the developers? Or are you basically just doing uh, Good question. Uh, so there has been interaction with the developers. Um, and you know, it's important. We have always believed that the best way to get the best result for the taxpayers and the citizens is to have a good, healthy, competitive process. And uh, so we've wanted to use that competitive process to make sure that they're thinking everything through. If they're saying things, we're really sort of pushing on it so that we un make sure we really understand each other um, in at, the, at, at the high level in terms of the, ba the, the big deal terms and the program. Um, before there's a commitment to saying, hey, you're the top ranked. Um, even after that top rank, what the, what the council's action will be on Monday is to enter into a, an interim agreement. And that sets a six-month schedule to get to a comprehensive agreement where there are actually commitments made by the city and by the developer. Um, so the interim agreement still is a period where the city could say, you know, this isn't working out. We're going to go to the number two. That is built into the procurement process that we've established. Yeah. Any more insights into what's going on with the Virginia Tech property, especially given... into there? So that's a question that is of great concern to us. Um, so I'll say one thing. As, as we've been thinking about our 10 acres, we have been very encouraging of our neighbors to think about what the future of their property would be to, jo to join us in planning for the future. And I think Virginia Tech has been very progressive in doing that. And so they have a vision for what they want to do on, on, their, on their land there. Um, I think that they're going to be going public with that fairly soon. Certainly in the past week, all the attention was on the innovation campus that will be in Alexandria, and then that is through a partnership with their engineering school. Um, and there are other uh, schools and other programs that will not be at that innovation campus. And so the discussion will be, uh, would they go to the West Falls Church campus uh, as part of their redevelopment? 
But that's, that's really a, announcements for Virginia Tech to make, and I don't have any uh, perfect insight as to what their plans will be. But so far, the, I think the dialogue has been open, and, uh, and I think we should be pretty pleased with the fact that we went to them four years ago to tell them what we were planning to do, encourage them to really think about their future, and they have responded. Uh, they, they've, they've been thinking very hard about what they could do on this. So the main show is the school, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Noonan, but I will be here for the whole time, so when we get to the next round of Q&A, if there are any follow-up questions on the economic development, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed. Yeah. question to a certain degree, but also just in terms of Amazon's decision, uh, how does that, does that have any impact on Correct. So the question is, has Amazon uh, resulted in changes to the proposals? Or desire. desire to change the proposals? Not at this point. Um, that could happen in the future. Um, one thing that I think the Amazon announcement does and Amazon's plans do is that the city, that, that the Northern Virginia has had an overhang of uh, it used to be about 20 million square feet of vacant office space. Now it's you know lower than that, but still. Uh, in the Roslyn Boston quarter, there's about five million square feet of vacant office space. And this is all sort of the hangover from the BRAC uh, round of defense realignment, um, as well as the recession. And I think what Amazon will help do is, is recharge and re-energize the commercial office market. And that is something that the city is very interested in. We've had a big headwind for a decade now of us trying to help you know, uh, balance our tax rate with more commercial, pure commercial development, and that's been difficult to do uh, with all this vacant Class A office space. It's you know. Okay. All right. Thank you, Wyatt. Thank you. Uh, I saw Shannon Litton. Congrats. Thank. No, I was going to say congratulations. The congratulations for making it. <laughs> We're so glad to see you. Anyway, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I'm really excited to be here today uh, to share some of the new information that we have um, about our new high school um, that we are in the process of continuing uh, to put together. And as I, as I talk today, um, some people have sort of said I'm a little overly enthusiastic about this, so I, I will try to curb my enthusiasm a little. Um, but I do want to share with you the excitement that I have because it really is um, and out, what you're going to see today is an outgrowth of a number of conversations. Um, Wyatt put up the list of the Sunday series um, conversations that we've had. In addition to those, we've had um, over, we actually in some total, we've had over 100 meetings about this high school, um, talking about the design with teachers, with staff, uh, with um, the community, with students, and the like. And so uh, what you're going to see today is really an outgrowth of those conversations that we've had along the way. We've tried to listen very carefully. We've tried to uh, create structures and circumstances when the community came in to give us good feedback. Um, if you've been to our website and looked at our, uh, our, our Falls Church City Schools new high school website, you'll see all of the minutes, all of the videos. We've had hundreds of, of questions that have been uh, answered. We've taken great pains to try to answer every single one of them. Um, sometimes the answer is thanks for your feedback or thanks for your comment, but we've tried to give feedback to each one of those. Um, and what you'll see today, I think, is um, not just an outgrowth of those conversations, but the schools and the planning team and the architects and the construction folks really trying to be responsive to the conversations that we've heard. And so I am, I am really excited to share with you today um, sort of the new, uh, the new high school. Um, for those of you that saw the new high school for the first time in the fly-through or on the website when it first was presented way back when in uh, January, February time frame, um, you will see and note some changes. Phil Writinger just showed. Welcome, Phil. Glad you're here. Uh, you will note some changes in the actual design of the external facility as well as some changes on, in the interior. And all of those have been a consequence of conversations, some refinement in, in the architecture, some refinement in the envelope itself. 
um, and again, sort of being responsive to the needs of the community. So just in terms of orientation, um, let me spend just a second sort of reorienting you uh, to make sure everybody's clear about what we're looking at. Um, this is Mary Ellen Henderson as it, as it exists today. The front still stays where the front is. Um, this is what we're calling affectionately School Street that comes along here. Um, if you were to look at Mary Ellen Henderson as it exists today, this area right here is where the um, loading docks are. So the loading docks for Mary Ellen Henderson along with the high school will be relocated to the back of the school. So you come back along, uh, we've got sort of a smoother faced front. This area of green space is open. And then there's a connecting point here between the middle school and the high school I'll talk more about in just a, in a few minutes. Um, and then we have the new high school. Uh, this is the promenade or the one earth, if you will. Um, that's a, a new term for me, which is kind of a welcoming area uh, to the school. You'll note, uh, you'll see some green spaces in the buildings. One of the things that I'll call your attention to right off the bat that we heard from the community was, is there enough space, outdoor space, for our students to engage and participate in? Because we are going to a vertical site as opposed to this large sort of uh, horizontal site. So we've, we've taken um, some really significant steps, I think, to create some outdoor spaces within the new building that weren't there the last time we showed this building. So you'll see some outdoor spaces here. Um, I'm going to call this, uh, just so you're familiar with the terminology that we've been using, this is the skinny bar. Um, this is the heart of the school, which is sort of the middle area. And this is the fat bar. So we've got the fat bar, the skinny bar, and the heart of the school here. Um, of course, this is the stadium field back here that is untouched completely during um, this construction project in the building of the new high school. Our existing baseball field also untouched throughout the whole process. Um, here you'll see a new um, full-size turfed uh, athletic field in the back. We've got six new tennis courts uh, that will be here built on solid ground so they won't sink. And then we've got a new softball field uh, in this area here. Um, again, off to this side you'll see uh, existing parking and there's more parking this direction which we'll talk about and then there's also surface parking here. Um, we understand that one of the things the community has been um, quite concerned about is the amount of parking and I think we've got a solution to that that I'll share with you today. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we kind of were all on the same page of what we were looking at as we go forward. So the line, the 10 acre line is about here. Um, of course, it's a straight line, not a jagged line like I'm doing here. Um, but this would be the 10 acre development, either EYA, PN Hoffman, or, Re or, um, or Rushmark. Uh, and then over here is Virginia Tech and uh, University of Virginia. So then when we look at the actual site plan, um, here again, you've, you've probably seen this site before, but essentially we're looking at it from about 3,000 feet up. Um, we've got the front of Mary Ellen Henderson here, Henderson uh, Middle School back this direction. Um, this is where the new uh, loading area and loading docks will be for the high school and the middle school because this is, all, uh, this is where the, the two buildings connect and this is where some of the cafeteria and servery areas are going to be uh, that will serve both the high school and the middle school. This is the skinny bar, this is the heart of the school, and this is the fat bar. There's a couple of things that I want to point out here right off the bat that have been changes, and if you were with us at the last Sunday series, you'll recognize that. Um, and the first is that um, this fat bar used to be parallel to the skinny bar. So it kind of was tilted at a different angle. It was kind of more this direction to be parallel with the skinny bar. There are a couple of things that we were trying to accomplish um, in this process. One was trying to widen out the space towards the stadium field back here to create more of a promenade for students. Um, and also trying to widen out the front of the school so that the heart of the school when you walk in, you feel this very wide sort of open, welcoming area. And, and the, uh, then the last thing um, that was consequential about this move by tilting it a little bit differently is that uh, it's on a better orientation for our lead gold net zero uh, ready building. Um, which we are still completely committed to. Just let me stop there just for a second, just to say uh, that we have registered as a LEED Gold project uh, already. So if you go on to the LEED uh, site, you can look up George Mason High School and you'll see uh, the LEED, uh, our LEED uh, um, application that's in. Uh, and by meaning net zero ready means that we will have all of the infrastructure available in our building to be able to go fully net zero when we get into 
um, a, a place we can get the PV arrays or the photovoltaic arrays on the roofs. Uh, we currently have a request for information out um, with companies that do these power purchase agreements so that we can, uh, as we move along, decide who best to work with to get the PV arrays because if we're net zero ready and we can work with a company to have uh, PV arrays put in as part of our power purchase agreement uh, that doesn't have any cost to us, why not make it fully net zero? So we're, we're moving in that direction. So we've got the widened out heart of the school here. We've got a little bit more space towards the back for the promenade. Uh, we've tilted this bar here a little bit. Um, we've got some more green space here in the front. Here you'll see a couple of drives. All of these are going to be accessible uh, by, by pedestrian traffic and also uh, by emergency traffic if we need to. Um, and then this is what we, we call the trapezoid or the good friend zone. Um, and in this, there is surface parking here, there's surface parking along this direction, there's surface parking here, and what you can't see back in this direction that you'll be able to see in a future diagram is actually where the bus loop is, is now surf surface parking as well. So currently, we have about 450 spaces of surface parking at the high school. When this project is complete, we will have 400. So that's about 50 less than what we currently have but a whole lot more than we had when we began this project. So when Mr. Shields talked about the conversations that he's been having with the economic development folks for this side of the house, if you will, uh, one of the things that's come clear is that both Rushmark and EYAP and Hoffman are interested in sharing some of their parking infrastructure with the school. Uh, to the extent that we will be able to have some swing space and surge parking, so when there's a back to school night or a large event, or something like that, we are uh, likely going to have access to up to about 250, excuse me, about 250 additional spaces on the economic development site. So that brings us to about 650 spaces that are available for parking for the high school. Um, the 400 surface parking spaces is likely enough to accommodate, as it currently stands, our staff, our student, most of our students. Um, and some public parking that comes throughout the day. But again, we're working with this economic development site to be able to have additional parking. So, so that is again just sort of an, uh, a flyover. Um, here you'll see lots of trees, you'll see um, additional green spaces. This is a really nice area here that I want to talk about briefly. This has been identified as a potential space for our memorial garden. Um, I know that one of the things we're very interested in doing along with the Ed Foundation and folks that have been part of the George Mason community is to memorialize some of the many, many items that we have in our school uh, and bring those over to the new site. We have documented and we have cataloged every single brick, every single plaque, every single tree, um, you name it, we've cat cataloged it and we've identified it and we intend to use this space for a portion of memorializing some of it. Um, when there, there recently was a meeting between the Ed Foundation uh, and our, our team from Brailsford and Dunleavy and some uh, our architects as well. And one of the things that we are really clear about from that conversation is any memorial that's put together to bring the past forward to the new needs to be in a very open and public space for everyone to see. And so we're committed to making that happen. So we've identified this as a potential spot, a potential memorial garden location for us as we move forward. All right. So moving ahead. Um, one of the things, the other thing that we heard um, was, and, and let me back up, when we, here's Henderson as it sits now, and right here, if you know the Henderson site, there's a basketball court and a sport court. And one of the concerns that came out of the many community meetings we had was, what's going to happen and where are our middle school students going to play during their recess time? So we tasked the architects to go back and to look at the overall space, and what we've been able to find is what we're calling middle school bonus space. And here at the end of the tennis courts is an area that's somewhat equivalent to the space that's over on this side that can be used as a sport court. We can put basketball hoops on there. We can surface that with some sort of um, top that uh, students can run around on and play on. So, so this uh, space is going to be available for our middle school students to come out and play. The other thing that I, I would remind folks is that this is going to be a walking path from the existing middle school between the softball field and the tennis courts that opens up to a brand new turfed uh, big full-size uh, soccer field back here too. So we're going to have a lot of places for our middle school kids to play. 
but we did identify this space to be able to put a, a new court down, have some basketball courts and the like. Um, here you'll see, again, the parking that's existing in front of Mary Ellen Henderson. You come back this direction, we've got some new parking back here, and then there is a sort of a racetrack of parking back in this area uh, as well, back to the, uh, that would be the south side of this new full-size, uh, tur fully turf soccer field. While I'm on the fully turf soccer field, one of the things that we're working really closely, and I see Danny Schlitt in the room, um, who is our head of parks and recreation here in the city of Falls Church, Danny and I have had a couple of conversations and we're going to work diligently uh, to figure out a way to get this uh, lit, that field lit, because we know that the return on investment uh, for both of our organizations is rather significant if we can um, utilize this space more than just during daylight hours. So we're working very hard to make sure that we get that space lit as well. And I know that that was something that the community was really interested in making sure happens as well. I'm talking so fast, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. All right. So that's the middle school bonus space. So here's the new elevation of the high school. Um, it looks very similar to the old elevation of the high school. Um, part of the reason that it looks similar is that the colors and the facade uh, materials are very similar. Um, the, the flagpoles in this little garden are in the same place. The bollards, the students are, are still there. Some of the things that you'll note might be different if you were to compare them side by side is uh, there were some large sort of posts that ran the length from uh, like this one here all the way across the front. Uh, we didn't see any need to have those. They weren't there for structural reasons, so why not open it up? Uh, again, underneath, uh, this is a cantilevered area that goes underneath to some uh, classrooms or to the office spaces below uh, that had some posts as well, and those posts weren't necessary. So some of the big things that you see here uh, that aren't here are those posts. Um, this is a nice feature, sort of this uh, roof line goes back to about um, the, not quite the middle of the, of the skinny bar, um, but again this is the skinny bar, this is the fat bar, this is the heart of the school. Um, and then this is the promenade area. Uh, you'll see the bollards there for safety. Um, this area on this side of the bollards is the bus loop or school drive if you will, and everything on the other side is uh, the school site. So this will be the new rendering of the school that we're going to be putting up there. Again, not significantly different than what was there before, but if you did look at them side by side, uh, you would note that there are some differences. Um, on the back side, um, again, very similar to what was here before, but one of the pieces of feedback that we received very strongly was some concerns about big, long, broad windows across this base uh, where the gym is. Um, we've maintained quite a bit of glazing, but you'll see in between um, the glazing that's there, there are some uh, breaks in this glass. Uh, and the purpose for that was uh, some concerns that came out about looking just into, uh, into space. It doesn't functionally change the look and feel of the school. Um, and the other thing that's important to note is the orientation of the building. For those of you that are interested, again, this is sort of a, a west to east orientation or east-west orientation. This side of the school, even in the middle of the summer, um, gets almost zero daylight. So in terms of any kind of concerns regarding light coming into the, into the field house or the, the gymnasium spaces here is not of concern. What we need to pay attention to is how much light actually is coming from the other side and into the gymnasium as well. Uh, direct, direct daylight, right? So no direct daylight coming in here. It is indirect daylight, uh, but no direct daylight. Um, here you'll note uh, these two areas, again, um, weird name, vomitorium, right? So two vomitoriums that come out. Um, this vomitorium is coming from the music and arts area, and this one is coming from um, the area with the um, dressing rooms and, and the like are coming out here. Here are the existing, existing stadium seats, um, and so you get a sense of, if you've been to our stadium in a while, you get a sense for how we're coming right up to that area. And this promenade back here is a little bit wider because we changed the orientation of this fat bar just slightly. So there's a little bit more space back there. All right, so when we get into, these are gonna be impossible to see. So I'm gonna to try to talk you through as best I can. This is gonna be up on the website um, tomorrow. So all of you can uh, take a, sorry? It's on there oh, it's on there now. Sorry, we did put it up ahead of the, ahead of the meeting. So hopefully you had a chance to look at it. Um, but I, I want to talk you through some of the changes that have happened here. This is the ground level. So if you think about um, coming in the front door, this is actually two levels down. 
Um, here are those vomitoriums that I was just mentioning that are these two here. Um, so those two vomitoriums go out to the field. On the left hand side is the PE area uh, and fitness area and on the right hand side is the performing arts area. So when you come down there are a number of ways to get down to this space. Um, there's a stairwell here, there's a stairwell here, and there is a stairwell here and one more over on this uh, side as well. And then anyone who needs um, the capacity for um, uh, needing an elevator, the elevators are over in this area as well. And that placement of the elevators is really important to us uh, for a number of reasons. One is it serves the whole building, but being close to the performing arts is important uh, where those lifts are so we can get materials and supplies and, and uh, equipment to the next floor. Um, these two elevators that are there, just by the way, are industrial size elevators. You can fit about 30 people in those. So if you think about, um, think about a hospital, uh, you can get a gurney into, they're uh, about that size. So they're not just small um, single user or multi-user um, multi lifts. They're, they're quite large. So you come downstairs and we'll start over in this area. Um, some of the things that you'll note have changed um, is the purple, uh, and this should be purple here next to it as well, the purple is the fine arts area. Um, we, this area that I'm pointing to here is a teacher collaboration space for the three or four teachers that are served in this lower level for the performing arts. Um, and as we make our way around the horn, I'm going to um, do my best to sort of start up in this area. This is instrumental music here. So this is band. Um, and here is the large instrument storage area for band. Um, we, have, uh, we have agreed that part of that instrumental storage will be for the school and also uh, we want to find some space in there for our city band as well. Um, here you'll see uh, this is a little bit, but sorry. Yeah, it's like robes uh, or uniform storage here. Uh, this is a small music library here. Um, and then kind of making our way around, this is a small individual practice room. This is an ensemble practice room, another ensemble practice room, and an individual practice room. Uh, and then we have the choral music area. And this area here is for robes for chorus and the like. Um, I see Mr. Northrup here. Um, congratulations on a great Chicago. Nice job. <coughs> Sean uh, has been instrumental, um, no pun intended, in helping us sort of design what this area is going to look like, but this is the black box. This is a new space for us in the arts. Um, and so there's a black box here with some storage in the back. Uh, and then this classroom is sort of a bonus classroom for the arts that we're calling a music lab. Um, this music lab can be used for a variety of different things. Um, we, we don't know exactly what the use is going to be, but if you consider it kind of like a musical maker space, uh, we may use it for digital music. Uh, we may have students doing music videos in there. There's a lot of different things that we can do in this space that will support our arts program down, uh, down at the um, ground level. Across the hallway are some additional restrooms that will serve the performing arts students that are there. Um, and one thing to note about these spaces that th is that they're all double height. So if you think of a ceiling being 12 feet, it's going to be 24 feet high roughly, 20 to 24 feet high. That's important for this black box uh, because in this black box we want to have a grid system above it so that students can get up there and they can maneuver and manipulate lights and the like um, so that it, it uh, looks, very sim looks and feels similar to being in a large house. So this is the performing arts area as it stands now. And then as we walk down this hallway, this is the training room um, and this is uh, the trainer's office here. Come this direction and we get into um, these are all of the dressing rooms or all of the um, spaces that can be used by physical education. So we've got a couple of team dressing rooms. On the left side are the uh, boys team dressing room here, boys team dressing room here, boys locker room, and then we have restrooms uh, also. And on the other side we have a uh, girls team room here, a girls team room here, girls restroom here, and then lockers here. Um, one of the things that I, I think we're very excited about and um, feel very good about doing is, is ensuring that all of the students at George Mason High School are comfortable and confident when they come to our school. So while we have sort of these binary uh, restrooms, boys on one side, girls on the other, we also have a large swath of um, any gender restrooms, uh, any gender changing rooms that are up here in the front. And we have six of them 
Um, so if a student isn't comfortable dressing in one of the, uh, the dressing rooms here, they can certainly use these as well. And the proximity to the office spaces here and here and here and here is also important for us in terms of supervision of this entire space. So then as you work your way around, Question. yes? Those are single user restrooms. And then we also are including um, in some of these spaces um, areas where students can pull curtains as well. So if they're uncomfortable, they can pull a curtain uh, and dress as well. So as you work your way around here, we get into, this is the fitness area. Uh, and in this fitness area, this is, so think weight room. If you've ever been to the weight room at George Mason, uh, current building, it's about the size of this room right here. Um, so this becomes the weight room and our fitness area that can be used for most, mostly students, but also our staff will have access to that fitness room as well. Um, we have some storage here, and then we get into the, the new wrestling room uh, down here as well. Again, we're going to have some storage here, uh, and then proximity to some, some up and down staircases is important for us to be able to get up, uh, up and down to above this area, which is the gymnasium. So as we move up, I'll share that with you. Um, I mentioned over here the importance of the proximity of these two uh, elevators. The other reason, not just being able to move timpani drums and some of the larger equipment up and down from the music area, is that on nights of shows or, um, and the like, oftentimes the black box is used, for, as I understand it from Mr. Northrup, uh, the black box is used for sort of pre-show activities. Kids are there. Um, and then they can, they can hop up um, the staircase right here, which takes them right backstage, uh, or they can just go up the lift as well. And I'll show you where that is on the next floor up. So that's the ground level. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that is correct. Uh, one thing I didn't point out here, too, is at this level, uh, there is a health room here because we do health and physical education. Uh, and we also do driver's education, so we've got a place for uh, a classroom space for that as well. All right, so I'm going to go up one level, all right? So we're going to take the stairs up, and here we are at the next level up, and this is one level just below grade. So if you think about coming into the school, you go down one level, and you come down this stair, and there are a couple of things you get to. Um, there's not much happening on this level except for these two big gymnasiums. So here is the new competition size gym. It's 94 foot in length. Um, the seating capacity in this gymnasium is 1,500. Uh, in one of the initial drawings you may have seen, uh, the doors were kind of in the middle. We've moved the doors to either side, which was important. Um, we've got some storage here. And we've got two staircases and stairwells here on either side. One of the original drawings also, there was a staircase here at the end. That's been moved to either side for purposes of uh, safety and the like, because we know that there needs to be some padding on the end here. Uh, so students who outrun or have to run into the wall because they can't stop themselves will be padded. But this is a 94-foot court here. Then you come down a little further. We've got some more storage here. And we have a, a smaller yet um, VHSL compliant, Virginia High School League compliant, auxiliary gym here. And we have seating for about 250 students in that auxiliary gym as well. So these are two big spaces. Um, if you're here for a game, there is a concession stand that's been built in here uh, that will be available for our, our uh, boosters to do their sales as they currently have. Um, you come back this direction, we've got some storage here. And then we've got restrooms here um, that, again, are uh, unisex restrooms, but we have a family restroom or any gender restroom here that's a one-stop uh, one, uh, as well. Um, and we've got some more storage uh, down this direction as well. So there's lots of storage for many of the things that um, we have happening on this floor. So Danny, you, you can see we've got some, some good spots. Yes, ma'am. There is. Um, I can't read where it is, but it's, it's on here and it says mat, it actually says mat storage. Dirk, can you? Right here? Right here. So mat storage is right here. That was important, that was important for uh, our, our wrestling folks to have a place to put their mats. Because the other option is to do them on a hoist and lift them up, but we feel like that makes more sense to, 
to have them here. And, it, and it's somewhat determinant on the type of mat we get too, because there are some that come in smaller squares and then there are the larger ones. Um, but we did build in the mat storage. All right, I'm going to take you to the ground level. You ready? <laughs> All right, so we get to the ground level, and this is the entrance to the building, right? So this is the heart of the school. Um, here is where um, you're going to see a couple of things. One is, um, this is, this is the new sort of monumental staircase, if you will, that goes up the, the spine of the school. So if you think about a person that's standing erect, they have a spine that goes straight up. This stairwell goes straight up to the fifth floor uh, and comes all the way down to the first floor. So when you come in, uh, you'll be able to see through that stairwell. Um, there will be doors here and doors here, so if we ever needed to, for safety purposes, close and stop any kind of uh, person from getting upstairs, we can remotely close those doors. Um, but those will work up and down the building. So that's an important sort of architectural component to think about is that it's sort of the spine that goes through the school. So you come in this building and the first thing you're going to do when you come in, and this is the, the front, the, the one earth for the promenade, is you come into a secured vestibule, which means that these doors are going to be closed. Uh, we've got a security officer or two located here and you can't go any further than this secured vestibule. This will be all ballistic glass in here. And once you've passed security and you've gone through the appropriate um, vetting process, if you're a visitor, you come into this door here and you meet our receptionist. And in this reception area, there are a number of different offices. And here is where the, um, the principal's office is going to be. So Matt Hills and his, staff, his, uh, his support staff will be here. Um, the assistant principals will not be on this floor, and I'll talk about that in, in a couple of minutes. But who is here is the International Baccalaureate Program is here. We have a testing coordinator here. Uh, we have our school resource officer that's located in here. Uh, we have a parent liaison that's located in here. And, uh, but anyway, you come in, you see the receptionist, and you can then, once you've passed the security, passed the receptionist, then you can go out right here and you can go into the heart of the school. Um, as you come in, and during the day, the security people will be here. The students won't have to go in this way during the start of the school. Students can come through, uh, but we'll have adults stationed there. Um, and so, so students will walk in. And if you go to the right, you get into the auditorium. And I want to take just a few minutes to sort of stop here, uh, because this was a, a pretty big component of conversation over the course of the last several weeks uh, or months. So this auditorium, as it exists right now in this uh, schematic design, has fixed seating of about 600 seats. That is about 100, well it's not about, it is 151 more seats than we currently have in our existing auditorium. So the next time Sean does his Chicago, uh, which will be a, about a four or five year rotation maybe, maybe more, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years? So the next time Sean does it in 20 years, uh, we will have a space, fixed seat of 600 uh, spaces and in addition to those 600 spaces, you'll see here off to the side, we've shown these. These are not fixed. These are loose seats. So they can be uh, put in and taken out. And if there isn't an orchestra, we can add some seats to the orchestra. So we can actually get capacity in the auditorium of closer to 650 or 675 with these additional spaces uh, on the side and in the front. Um, so that's important to note, that we are going to have many, many more spaces for seating than we currently have. The other thing that I want, to pay want you to know when we come in to the theater is that um, you can walk across this direction or you can walk down uh, to your seats this direction or this direction. We've got a middle crossing. We've got these two uh, as well. Um, but you can, you can access these seats from all sides and down the middle. Um, another question that came up in our conversations over the last couple of months is how wide is the proscenium opening? And the proscenium opening is the width from side to side. And in the last drawing, or the last rendering, the proscenium opening was 40 feet. And there was a lot of concern about that 40-foot proscenium opening and it being wide enough. And we had done the, the analysis of it. It was certainly wide enough to accommodate a 90-person band on the stage and being able to see them from each of the seats. But in, in more conversations uh, with uh, the arts and, and Sean and Mary, Mary Jo uh, and others, we realized that that 40 foot wasn't wide enough. So we now have a 50 foot wide proscenium opening, which is obviously 10 feet wider than it was before, um, which is better. The other piece that we were able to accomplish by looking at doing some loose seating in the front is we were able to gain some more space from front to back. 
Um, one of the pieces that we, we learned um, is, and obviously, those of you that are in the theater are familiar, but oftentimes during a show, a student needs to get to, from one side of the stage to the other side of the stage to be, be able to come on for um, some reason. And in the back, there's a, a thin sheet called a cyclorama, and you can run past it, but if you do, it kind of shimmies a little bit, and it can really be a visual distraction. So we are looking at something different. Um, by picking up that space, it allows us to maybe put something different back here so students can go from one side of the stage to the other. So we did gain some more depth here. There's a couple of other things in the auditorium that were done um, that were a result of the conversations that we had. Um, one was that we have um, a, a prop uh, area here uh, and a shop here um, that's a, a little, um, it's got access to the outside, but it does have access directly on stage. Um, over here we have uh, one, this is the uh, dressing room here, and we also have another dressing room here. You might remember from the original drawings, the dressing rooms were about the size of that. Uh, what we learned was the dressing rooms needed to be bigger and we didn't need as much bathroom space back spa backstage, so we did do some a smaller restroom here. Um, and the other thing that was important too is that this backstage is actually blocked off. So students don't ever have to leave backstage to get on stage from the dressing room. There was at one point some concerns in the community that students would actually have to go into public before they got backstage and that simply isn't the case. Uh, we've got this blocked off here. Stage access will be restricted during shows uh, to just this side of the house. Um, so we've got a little bit of storage here. We've got a small costume shop on the stage level, which was um, sufficient from what we understand for purposes of, of our shows that we're doing. Again, this is double height over on this side, so it, it's going up. Um, so, so that is the, the auditorium as it exists today. Um, this is the uh, entrance and area of administration. And then you come forward, if we come out of the auditorium and we go forward and we step down three steps, uh, this is the cafeteria. And this cafeteria um, is actually where we connect to the middle school. Um, it's not an obvious connection, but this is the single connecting point between the middle and the high school. But this is a large grab-and-go cafeteria. Here you'll see a small terrace. Um, this terrace is actually not so small. It's a rather large terrace that uh, walks outside, so students can eat outside on this terrace. And then if you remember from the original, or from the drawing before, this is where the softball field is. So for those of you that have been to Nationals Park, you know the red porch out in center field. Um, it's got that same sort of look and feel to it. So you can be at home plate on the softball field looking out, and students, can be sitting, students or parents can be sitting on the terrace having, having dinner or having some food and watching a game. Um, just to reorient you here a little bit, this is the new um, servery area. This is where our, our folks will be serving. And then the kitchen will be back in this area. This kitchen will serve both Henderson and will serve the high school. The serveries will be separate, however. So the high school will have its own servery. The middle school will have its own servery. Middle school cafeteria will be where it is now. And our cafeteria will be, the new high school cafeteria will be here. So the opening that comes back into this hallway is the connecting point between the middle and high school. This is an important um, point for us to make, is that that connecting point allows our students now to, within the same building, we have a lot of middle school students, about 70% of our middle school students are taking a high school course. Many of them are taking them with their teachers at Henderson, but it certainly provides much broader access to our curricular program at the high school for some of our middle school students that are accelerating and advancing quickly. It allows us to adapt and modify and adjust our staffings, staffing ratios appropriately. So if we, and, and it also allows us to flex staff back and forth. So if we need another section of Spanish, for example, taught at the middle school, and we have a high school teacher that has an open spot in their schedule, we may ask them to come over and teach that section at the middle school, and it's a super easy walk from the cafeteria through the other cafeteria and into Henderson. Okay, so that's the main level. Yes, sir? Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, from below. So this is yeah. the below. Right. Okay. But you don't have any.
We do, we have some small um, like uh, rehearsal rooms that will have some higher spaces. Yeah, our, our architect is here too. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to give you the microphone. Do you want to answer that, Dirk? Walls on the lowest level. Looks like there might be spaces. Are continuing with the bathrooms over that area, over one of the rooms below. The rake, now, right? But you still have the room. That's a really good point. Just bringing it up as an opportunity yeah. that might be there. That's a really good point, and we've tried to do that here, actually. So this is something I didn't, I didn't mention, um, but this is additional storage space um, for, uh, for the auditorium. So we'll have, so you saw on, on the last one, um, uh, get into this, this area, we have a very small, um, space that is the um, costume shop, but on the, ah, sorry. But we do have some costume storage above that will accommodate as well. So it's a good point. Just something I, that The other spaces that are also oh, Daisy Brangman from Brailsford and Dunleavy. She's our one of our owners reps. Um, the other spaces that are also double height, and again, this is schematic design. So there's still a level of development left. Um, you, the coral and the um, rooms are also higher than you know, but nine foot ceiling. So those spaces are also double height, but we are in discussions with the Gilbane team and the Stantec team to see what is the proper ceiling height for the spaces that don't need to be double height. And to your point, yeah, one thing one thing that we're trying to accommodate our goal is to be net zero. Um, so on the, uh, yeah, the <coughs> level and the first level, um, it looks like there's a wall uh, for the auditorium. Wall before you go into the company. So <coughs> question is with regard to the all the performing arts trophies and all the. <clears throat> there are the wall space adequate for the cases and is it made of material? But but all uh, support those. So that and then where do all the so it's a really great question. Um, one thing that I, I just want to reiterate, I suppose, is that we, we want to make sure that we pull our history forward. 
um, and that we accommodate all of, the, all of the trophies and the like that we've been able to accomplish in our, our great history at Mason. Um, there will be some public spaces. I don't know what those are going to look like or where they're going to be exactly right now, but I would imagine they're going to be down here somewhere. Um, but in some of the conversations that we've had uh, with the memorial team um, and also with other um, folks, uh, there, there may be an opportunity to look at some technological solution for some of those things as well. Um, maybe perhaps a Hall of Fame kiosk uh, and the like. There are lots of schools that are doing those now because there is so much and we can create some new space for some of the newer things. But um, we are looking at um, space being available for, for trophies and the like. drawing, the, the initial or overview drawing of the uh the windows for the uh, uh, the gyms were see-through windows. They'll, they'll likely be see-through. That's the plan. I've, I don't think I've ever said they were translucent. They may be translucent above, um, but we'll, we'll still be Yeah. Oh, one other thing that I didn't mention here. Um, again, very um, publicly accessible building um, because we, we really want to be able to allow the community to come in as often as they want. So here you'll see when you come in, there's a walk pathway back this way. And this is that above the um, auxiliary gym track that will be available as well for use as part of our instructional program and then also after hours to the community. And I know that that was something that was a, a big piece. It'll be open. Yeah. All right. So moving, moving on. So this is what you see when you come in. Um, this is now when I share these with you. I want you just to know that um, what you're seeing still is yet to be determined in terms of materials, colors, um, and the like. So, um, so, so fall in love with the flow, but maybe not the look, exactly the look. If 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 you see what you like. So you may remember from the original drawing or the original fly-through, when you came in the front, off to the left was a staircase that went immediately up, right? So, so remember when I said we created that spine that kind of goes up the middle? That spine is back here. Um, so when you come in, it gives a much fuller, wide open feel uh, of, of the school. You can see up to the second floor. It articulates nicely from the, first, from the ground floor to the second floor. This is the pathway up. Uh, off to the left is the administrative offices, and then over here is the theater. If you get past this point right here, that's where it steps down into, uh, into the cafeteria. So you get a just w much wider feel than it had when it, when it originally came out because it was kind of blocked off by sort of this wide staircase that went up there. Big, big move there was to move that staircase to the back. So safety and security, obviously, is something that is uh, really important to us. Um, and so there are a couple of things that I want to just share with you that are in place. One is, uh, in terms of hardening, is the safety and security vestibule, the hardened vestibule in the front. So when you walk in, again, you have to meet with a security person. All of this is ballistic glass. You have to be buzzed in uh, and the like. Visitors, are, all of our visitors will be routed through the main office. So it's a two-stop uh, process to get into the building. Um, our school resource officer will be located here. We also have created a circumstance where all of our active, uh, I'm sorry, all of our academic programs, with the exception of our fine arts and our PE, are for the most part on levels three, four, and five. Um, and that's important. And those can be secured from the heart of the school, meaning that this monumental staircase or staircase up the spine can be blocked off and no students can get above it or below this open area here. Uh, and that's important for us as well. And in this uh, program, you'll see uh, quite a bit of, of glass. It's not all glass, but there is some glass. 
uh, and we are providing blinds uh, for all the classrooms. And then there's one other security feature that I'll share with you when we get to it about how um, our classrooms sort of articulate together from the back uh, into a central location. And that was a, another change that was made. But um, on top of all of these sort of hardening pieces, um, the other thing that I, I want to call your attention to is where we've located um, the, the suite of services for kids. So again, our assistant principals won't be here on the first level. They'll actually be on the third floor along with our school social workers, our school psychologists, and our school counselors. So, and they're going to be right where the kids are. So it's more of an accessible suite. So if students are struggling or need some support or need some help, they'll be able to access through that point. So let me, let me take you um, uh, uh, just over to the middle school. Again, this is uh, where the, the high school and the middle school join. Um, this is the servery for the high school. Um, here is the kitchen area, and here is the middle school servery. And then this is the cafeteria, or cafetorium at, at Henderson. One of the things you'll notice that has changed, if you have students at Henderson or spend any time there, is these used to be the doors outside onto the sport court that's back here. And you remember that the servery and the kitchen were over here. That actually is flipped um, so that we can find some efficiency by putting a, a shared kitchen in to both the high school and the middle school. And we move the classrooms that were over here over to this side of the building. And all of that will happen during a summer, so it won't impact uh, any of the operations of the buildings, either of the buildings as we're moving along. So then we get into um, sort of the, the first level up. Um, this is the second level above, or first level above the main sort of grade level. So you come upstairs, you come up that central spine, and you walk into sort of an open space here for some flexible seating area. Um, there's a little cafe here that may, um, we may do hot beverages, we could do cold beverages, we could do little food items here. Uh, and then this is the new media center, or the, the library. Um, if you go to, if you go this direction, we've got some classroom spaces and the like. We've got a maker studio uh, as well. And then on this side of the hallway, this is the, t the upper level of the auditorium. Um, one thing I want to call your attention to is this is an ad alternate. This is the mezzanine. It would add about 100 seats to uh, the auditorium, and we're talking through whether or not we need additional 100 seats and the versus cost, and so we're trying to find the value in that. Um, but up here is the control room and control booth for the, the um, auditorium. And then this is a large storage area, kind of picking up on the conversation earlier about having double height spaces. This didn't need to be a double height space. Um, in, as part of the auditorium. So this is now going to have uh, an area for storage, and that's a really important component to um, what Mr. Northrop has shared with us as well. So to give you a sense of what that looks like, if you're walking up the stairs, let's just say you came in the building, you walk up, and then you turn, and you're coming up to the second floor, this is what you walk into. And here you've got this open seating area. You can see down to the first floor from here, looking out towards the front of the building. Uh, we've got a, a little cafe, grab and go something, um, and, and that's just kind of a nice open welcoming space on that top level. Lots of natural light, which is really important in this building. Um, and then if you flip, turn around and look the other direction, this is looking into the new Media Center uh, library. And so here you'll see um, some areas and spaces available for students to work. There's shelving, there are office spaces along this wall as well as a classroom space. Um, and then some flexible seating over on this area, in this area as well for students. Again, you'll see lots of um, outdoor light being able to come in and fill the space as well. Then we get to the third floor, and this is where sort of, um, and, and let me go back, because you may hear us in the past refer to this level as sort of the, the, the living room of the school, right? So when you come up to that second floor, this really does kind of become the living room where you've got the media center, you've got this open space, you've got a cafe and, and the like. So then we get into the third level. So you come up the stairs in that central spine. And as you get up there, again, kind of an open collaborative space here for students to, uh, to congregate and to hang out. Um, if you go to the right, um, this is where you get into the administrative student services suite. So in this area, you're going to have assistant principals, school psychologists, social workers, yes. Yeah. So 
Can we pass it to? This is Dirk Jeffrey. He's the uh, architect from Stantec who's been working with us. Second floor to the third floor is. Sorry. Second floor level to the third floor level. So, and it could be varying heights, right? It's just for interest and intrigue, too. Right? So this is where, again, this is kind of where things start to happen. So you come up these stairs, you get into this commons area. This is the uh, student services suite. Um, we've got uh, the art, uh, uh, visual arts are here. So we've got a kiln room. We've got what you don't see here is there's going to be a small dark room in this area. We've got two classrooms. Um, we've got a pottery area. We have a lear another learning studio that's here and available to students. There's a seating area here. Uh, and then if you come up and you go left, um, what you may remember the last time we were together was on this floor, we had created teacher work offices right down the middle of this hallway. Um, that got away from sort of what our original conceptual idea and why we selected the architects we did when we got into that. Because what ended up happening was you had office spaces here down the middle, so you just had a racetrack of hallways that kind of went around, and, and you had what essentially was a double load uh, corridor building. So you walk down this hall, you'd have offices here and classrooms here all the way down. When we selected Stantec Architects, and the community was really excited about it too, was there was much more open space, spaces for collaboration. If you've been to George Mason High School, you see kids sitting everywhere across that building. That building does not work for the, the process of education that we're engaged in now. So we need to create spaces for kids to, to be able to sit and to collaborate and to work together. So what you see here is this is all, um, this is open space here for collaboration. There's a small collaborative office here. There's open space here for collaboration. This is a small collaborative office here for students and open space here. And then these are the, the only fixed rooms that you'll see in this design are the science labs. So these on the ends are science labs. And you'll see words like learning studio. That's another name for a classroom. So all of these are classrooms here. Classrooms here, here, and, and then this large area off to the side as well. Um, so it's important to note that part of the reason that there's a lot of glass on this side of the, of the hall facing out this direction is we really want to use the entire building for our instructional program. So if I'm teaching in this classroom, let's say I'm teaching English, and I ask four kids, I want you guys to go off and I want you to work on your poem, I want you to collaborate right here, I haven't lost visual sight line or supervision of those students while they're out in that hallway. That gives me the capacity to really expand my existing classroom into a much bigger area. And that's what's happening at our school right now. But what's unfortunately happening is we're losing visual sight lines of kids all over the place. Um, so this allows us to maintain those visual sight lines. The other thing it does is it's not just me keeping eyes on my kids out here either. It's all of these teachers keeping eyes on these kids out here. So if they start doing something, not that 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds do anything they shouldn't be doing, but if they are, if they are, we've got lots of eyes on them out here. Another thing that was really important from the community's perspective that we needed to address was how are we getting um, space outside? How are kids getting outside? So you'll note here, we took some square footage out. There were two classrooms here, and we created a terrace outside. So students can walk out onto this terrace and have an opportunity to be outside. We may put some tables out here where kids can sit. And then this is a green roof here and a green roof here with another small terrace right here. So there's a, there's a couple of opportunities from this third level to be able to go outside. The third floor really functions as a fully uh, inclusive instructional environment. And what I mean by that is that we've got all the adults that students need to be able to see, other than their teachers, kind of co-located on this floor together with them. And they can float among and between the classrooms. And the other is that there's a lot of open spaces for kids to collaborate, um, some commons areas to congregate uh, and the like, and lots of natural light that's coming in. The, the last piece of safety and security that I want to share with you that I think is um, important is in the last drawing, you might remember that we had these little doorways in the backs of classrooms that sort of led to a middle classroom that had what looked like a small workroom or a small area for storage. 
And the idea was that perhaps we could, in, an, in a crisis event, students could leave those classrooms and go into those storage areas uh, and shelter in place. As we started to talk about what does that look like from a supervision perspective, what happens in those spaces when there isn't a crisis in place, which is 99.9% .9 of the time, it ended up in some ways being space that wasn't best utilized. So what you'll see here is that these classrooms, all, all roads lead to this middle room here, um, all roads lead to this room here and this room here, but this, these rooms where all of these doors open into will become, I don't want to say safe rooms, but shelter in place rooms, and these will be outfitted with ballistic glass uh, and, and have hardening protocols in them, so if there was a need to shelter in place, we'd be able to do that there. But in the meantime, it would still be used and dual purposed as uh, a classroom functioning space. And again, just as a reminder, um, this central staircase, all of these staircases, uh, and this one over here, can be remotely shut off. So if there was ever a critical incident, we could very quickly shut down any access to the floors above. Um, all right, so that's the third floor, and this is where the innovation commons are. We've got academic areas that are really flexible, lots of daylight, and the student services in the, the skinny bar, or the thin bar. Then we go up to the next level, and this is where, oh, sorry, I'm going to, this arrow means something. <laughs> so this is your vantage point. So right now, you're looking up, uh, because this is where the learning stair, the learning stair begins right here. So if you're looking this direction and look to the right, this is, this is kind of what you see. You'd be looking out this way, kind of looking up to the right. This is that learning stair that was in the last uh, drawing. The last time you saw this, it actually was oriented a different direction, and it actually faced outside. And it didn't really make a lot of sense for the, this beautiful learning stair to look outside. But instead, why not utilize this in a way that could really be powerful to the instructional space? And so it was reoriented from over here to this direction, sort of facing in. And up here, you'll see um, a, a classroom maker space up here that it articulates with. But it's a really nice movement from the third floor to the fourth floor. And over on this wall, what you'll see is um, a classroom space here. But above that, and this is kind of a double height space, there could be some sort of kiosk or a big, um, I don't want to say TV, but a screen that we could project information on. Um, it could be used for uh, presentations, et cetera, and students could sit here. Somebody mentioned what a great place to perhaps even have homecoming, right? Could you see homecoming happening here? This is maybe a garage door that could roll up from this classroom uh, that could open another space over here. Kids dancing here, hanging out on the stairwell here, maybe having some food up in this area. Um, but some really nice vision that came from this. Um, but this is, this is an important move. Uh, to change this learning stair to be able to articulate from the third floor to the fourth floor going up. And throughout this building, I think that's one of the really cool things that I've enjoyed is that it doesn't feel like this monolithic stack. It really is just sort of all of these floors that kind of nicely weave together. So then we get up to the fourth floor. Again, um, this fourth floor, the learning stair comes up into this area. Um, if you go right, we've got a couple more. Uh, Science labs, science labs here. Um, one thing I didn't mention on the third floor, it's the same on the fourth and same on the fifth, is these offices were teacher offices, we moved them here. So the teacher offices are here. Each of our teachers will have a space where they can put their materials, their supplies. They'll still have a classroom, um, but it's a nice quiet workplace for them to uh, be able to retreat to, have a team meeting. There's a restroom off the hall here for teacher use uh, and other if they need it. Uh, and then you can walk down this way, look over onto the third floor. Again, a learning common here, a learning commons here. Uh, then you kind of come this direction. We've got some more classrooms back in this area, some more learning spaces back in this area, and along here. Um, so really a, a cool sort of, again, articulating way to kind of come up these stairs and, and go into this, uh, this space. And then the blue arrow um, is your vantage point. So the next thing you're going to see is a picture kind of looking down. And this is what you're looking at when you're in this spot right here. You're looking over that wall and into this commons area down here. Remember, these are collaborative spaces, offices here, collaborative offices here. These primarily are for kids, uh, but, but 
teachers might use them as well, but there's a lot of, again, open spaces along here for seating, along here for seating, um, where students can collaborate as well. So then we get into the fifth floor. And remember, the four-story the four story building stops. Um, so the skinny bar stops, and all we have left is the fifth floor. And up here, you, you come up and you take, a, take your left as you come up and you go in. Uh, we've got learning commons, open spaces here, here. This overlooks that terrace that was created. Um, but what you'll also see on, on this floor is this is the outdoor classroom that was in the original design. We've been able to preserve that. It's really important to us so students can walk into this space and here uh, they can be, they'll be outside. So there's no, uh, no ceiling above. Um, it goes right out. So your vantage point, um, you're not actually looking from the bathroom out, although it looks like you're looking from the bathroom out. You're kind of looking from this direction into that commons area. And there you see that's the outdoor classroom space um, that students will be able to access. Some things that were added to this level that I, I think are important is, again, uh, making sure that we have this larger, more centralized space for learning for students outside. Um, we have another roof line that students will be able to look out, uh, perhaps is vegetated, um, we're hoping. Um, more breakout spaces here. And then this is where the fabrication and robotics area is as well. Um, another reason why we need those big, huge uh, lifts so that we can get our robots up and down, up and down this building as well. So that's the fifth floor. And again, that's your vantage point kind of looking into that outdoor space, um, which we hope will be used a lot. And you'll see collaborative spaces here and here, and a lot of flow around it. So what can I, what can I answer for you? What do you think? Wow. Yeah. Kind of cool, right? Yeah. I'm totally excited about it. And, and I think what I'm most excited about, about it is that um, you know, we said all along that we weren't going to do this in a vacuum, and I think we've gotten a lot of really great feedback from the community, and I think we've been able to incorporate that. Um, can we do absolutely everything we want? No, we'll never be able to do everything we want, but we can do an awful lot of it, and I think that this design, and, and my hat goes off to Dirk and his team, has really come a long way uh, from its original design to, to gain some of those spaces that we were really... What questions do you have for me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so George Mason now has about 90-ish doors. I, I assume they're going to be fewer here, but in terms of emergency, press, what, what's that look like? Yeah, great question. Um, the answer to, your, to the first part is yes, we have way too many doors uh, and, and have, uh, because of that, some access control things that we need to pay attention to, right? So that's why we have uh, bat swipe in, uh, swipe out doors and the like. This is going to have many, many fewer doors, much less access. The primary point of access will be through the front, uh, through that security vestibule. We're going to route all of the traffic through there. But in terms of egress, there's, there's ample egress. Um, you know, obviously it has to be to code, so it will be to code, but all of the stairwells down the backside egress out of the building. Um, and from a safety and security perspective, that's important um, because if teachers in a crisis incident, incident have an opportunity to leave the building, that's much preferred than staying in the building. So there are going to be ample opportunities for people to leave. The Sir, you had a question? Yes, we, we, are, um, we are building this for 1,500. It absolutely has the capacity for 1,500. Um, right now, the utilization rate, if we open in, say, December 2020 or January 2020, um, we're looking at about an 80% utilization rate. Right around there, 80% utilization rate with about 1,000 students. So that allows us to grow rather significantly. And um, one of the nice things about some of these spaces and the way that this has been designed is it's 
I don't want to say modularized. What's the right term? Is it modularized? Maybe it is, but um, there are spaces that can be expanded and constricted for different purposes. Um, so this design allows us to kind of move and flow with that. But um, when we look at the space utilization of this building in the out years with 1,500 students, we are right on target. So one of the things we've looked at, and I don't know if you'll see them in here. I'm going to back up. I don't think you'll see them. Um, oh, there we go. One of the things we looked at uh, right here. There's some down here and up in here. So, so these are called half-height lockers. Um, this is half-height glass. So one of the things that was a real question early on was, are, is this, first of all, is this a whole bank of glass, right? And, and hopefully this rendering makes it clear that we're not talking about full banks of glass. Um, along the walls here, but these half-height lockers are going to be there. We're not exactly sure what the right number is, but when I have, I've talked to about 400 high school students, I've, I've surveyed about 400 high school students about their locker use, and it's about one for every hundred students that use their locker currently. So, so there's not going to be one for everybody. What we might do is a small number of these half-height, sort of in a bus depot sort of style, like if you need one for the day, come, check out a key, we'll check it out to you, you can use it for the day, bring the key back. Um, so we're looking at a solution that probably better for everybody that way. Got uh, two back behind you. <coughs> Hasn't been posted. I'm sorry. We're working with our procurement agent right now. Yeah, good question. Um, this TV studio is on the fourth floor. Um, so, third. Third floor, excuse me. The third floor, um, we are looking at the TV studio being in this area right here. Nice about that is um, the learning stair kind of goes up from there. Um, so one of the things that we sort of envision, perhaps, is uh, for those of you that watch the Today Show, um, they have sort of glass around the outside and people can kind of walk by and see what's going on. Uh, of course, there'll be curtains and drapes that you can pull shut if you need to. Um, but we, can, we could see that being open so that students could walk by and be able to see what's happening in the TV studio. That's a good question. So in case you didn't hear it, um, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, I'm going to repeat some of what you said. You like the flow. You like the, the openness. It feels good to walk around. If a teacher needed a break, is there a place they could go for some calm or from some mindfulness and the like? 
Um, there's a couple things we've done here. One is um, this is going to be sort of a teacher retreat area. And then there is, um, what do we call in the room? Wellness room. So, so there will be a wellness room in each one of our uh, teacher collaborative spaces. So if they wanted to meditate or if they needed to, um, uh, opportunity as well. Oh, yeah, so, so the question was, are there areas where students could go? Um, we have these breakout areas here that are sort of cordoned off. We don't have them necessarily called wellness. Is that what you were thinking? Um, but there could be some smaller spaces available. Back to you on that. 24 hours a day. No, 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 yeah. Five days a week. Yeah, we want to create, we want to have some spaces where students go and, yeah. and, and be calm. So, Yeah, that's still to be defined. So, so just in terms of uh, where we are now, um, this, is, this sort of brings us to the end of schematics, right? And so now we're going to get into de design development. And so the schematic design is sort of does the geometry work, um, do the spaces work? And so that is uh, something that we continue to look at. Yeah. Um, well, let me be clear. I, I don't know when we're going to hit the maximum utilization. Not, I'm certainly not certain about that. What I am certain about is that we're building a high school for 1,500, that we can grow. So um, the other piece that um, we look at, and I, you raise a good point, is like what is the yield, the student yield from new construction? So if you look at the surrounding jurisdictions, Arlington, Fairfax County, the city of Fairfax, Alexandria, typically the typical methodology is that um, they look at new construction once it comes online, first of all. So because it hasn't been approved by the city council, that has not become part of the algorithm by which we plan. 
Um, so when we send information to Weldon Cooper, who is our projections group, um, who also distributes state sales tax, um, which is important, um, they, they don't take into account larger uh, development until it has been approved by the local jurisdiction. At that point, we can say to them, there are, let's say, let's say a thousand, just for round numbers, a thousand units coming online over the course of the next three years. We need you to build that into our projection. Then they'll take that into account. The current wisdom, if you will, of the surrounding jurisdictions and the methodology that they use is that new construction for the first 15 years, and 15 years is sort of a critical mark, yields about a 0.17 students per unit, and that's based on all unit sizes, studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, typically about a 0.17 for, for new construction. So if you have 1,000 units, you can count on about 170 students coming to you. So let's say in three years, our student population is 1,000 students and 1,000 new units go in. That means that we would jump from 1,000 to about 1,170. Um, we have space for that. So we're, we're really trying to make sure that over the long term, and really 25 to 30 years, that we have the adequate space to meet the needs of the community. Neither of the two developers have indicated that they want to put 1,000 units in, right? So we got one that's eight something and another that's four something. So knowing that those are less than 1,000 and we can count on about 0.17 for the first 15 years, um, we, we feel really good about the size and the design. What's interesting, just for, for purposes of um, self too, is that that 15 year mark is, um, it, the reason that it changes is because those uh, become older units. They're considered older units at that point. And as new units come online, those older units typically will drop in price. And as they drop in price, um, at least what we've seen in other jurisdictions, more people will move in with more kids. So after 15 years, the yield goes up to about 0.3. So on 1,000 units, you might have 30, 300 kids, 300 kids as opposed to uh, Sir. Uh. <coughs> Yeah, programmatically, we're still, working through, we're still working through what programmatically it's going to look like. We're going to continue um, our posture of the one-to-one the -one at the high school and at the middle school. Um, I don't know what the current technology is going to be in two years, um, but the way that we have structured our purchasing, um, we have some flexibility when we get to that point to buy what is the most current, uh, current technology. In terms of like infrastructure, um, I, I don't know the answer to that, and so Dirk, you may know the answer. I don't know, but we we're working on the details. That's probably a terrible answer, but um, but we we don't want to put something out there that's antiquated. So one example, just here's one example: is the security cameras. We'll have security cameras through the building. We'll have security cameras on the exterior of the building. Um, we're not using Cat Five anymore, right? We're using Cat Six, and so if there's but if there's a newer technology will use the appropriate technology at the time. All the classrooms we're going to have, yeah, and we, yeah, so all the, they'll all have either smart boards or some sort of interactive board. Um, what we're seeing now is that perhaps a better move from a smart board is some sort of flat panel interactive screen um, that can double as a television, uh, art screen, if you will. We're looking at all of that. But we're, yeah, one thing is we're eliminating an entrance to the middle school, right? So that, that back area, yeah. Um, there's a secure vestibule at the middle. When you walk in, you have double, you have to go through two sets of doors and you're buzzed in. He's got to let you in. He's got to let you in the first set. And then you're in a secured vestibule, 
and then you go into that second set. Um, but we, you know, we can certainly continue to talk about that. I, you know, we, we really want to make sure that it's as safe as possible, but that secure vestibule is really an important component. That's great. That's a great question. Thank you um, for asking it because it, it really is important to us. The, the first, the first and foremost, this building works for us as opposed to having a building that works again. Right. So if you look at, um, for example, the um, profile of a Virginia graduate that the State Department of Education puts out, it talks about its four, five C's. Right. The most important things that students need to know, be able to do, and by the time they graduate from high school, is to communicate, be critical thinkers, be collaborative creative and but essentially you get the idea that there's a, yeah there's a core set there's a core set of skills that we want our kids to be able to do some of the most important of those to me are the critical uh, critical thinking collaboration and creativity this building allows us to do all of that together right but right now in our building when you walk in if we want our kids to be collaborative they just it's just too hard hard from a safety and security perspective, a visibility lines of sight line um, perspective and the like. This opens it up and allows us to do some of those things differently. Each of these spaces are going to be outfitted with um, appropriate technology. He walked out, right? So appropriate technology to, to meet their needs, have state-of-the-art um, laboratory uh, materials and the like. Um, one of the things that we're talking about uh, perhaps doing is thinking about could we even you know, take what we're doing currently with P Dr. Mecca uh, and the like with some of the uh, aquaponic work that he's doing and some sustainability work that he's doing and even make that a higher profile but looking at it through greening technologies and renewable energy and the like. And we can use this building to achieve that because we can use the envelope to say how is this building helping us as opposed to, to hurting us from an environmental perspective. Um, collaboration for teachers is going to be absolutely vital. And by creating these spaces for teachers to collaborate, um, our teachers are going to be better at their craft. Um, we know that when algebra teachers want to get better, it's way better than an algebra teacher talks to another algebra teacher than goes off to. We're going to get some new ideas, but to become a better practitioner, they need to meet with each other. And so we're creating spaces for our teams to be able to come together to talk and to meet. So um, I, I see a number of upsides here. Um, but primarily, it's around being creative. You see in here some maker spaces, you see maker studios, you see robotics labs, you see um, even in the arts, we've got the music lab, uh, which is yet to be defined how that can be used. Um, but lots of opportunities to be creative, lots of opportunities to be collaborative. Um, and then our teachers are experts at asking our kids to think. That comes with the International Baccalaureate. It's really critical questions throughout. Where's your rack here? Sorry. Oh. Better air quality, better day lighting, all of those kinds of things, which are really important. I was unfortunately sitting in the wings of uh, the Chicago rehearsal a couple of days ago, and uh, the girl was out on stage, and she said, <laughs> as she was standing in the middle of the stage, so not having rain inside will be really great. <laughs> it's a low bar, but, uh, but an important one nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. But day, daylight is important, air quality is important, so all of those things will come into play as well.
Great question. Thank you. It's the perfect sort of way to wrap us up, too. Um, so the next step in this process is design development. Um, and it's sort of a big, broad category, and it's going to last probably four months or so. Um, and out of that, we're going to take each of those spaces and sort of ex expand them. What, are the, what does a classroom look like? Um, where should the orientation of some of the hard fixtures be? Where sh um, how does this actually function from day to day? Um, so our first set of meetings that we've already begun to develop uh, will be with all of the teachers within each of the departments to start looking at the design. Um, we will continue to meet with the community for our Sunday series. Um, we'll continue to brief the board on a routine basis. Um, and as we get in further into design development, we probably will have a couple more community meetings outside of this Sunday series to talk a little bit more about how the spaces are being developed. Um, one example of that, and, and some of them are already existing, had a chance to meet with the foundation um, not too long ago and talk through the schematic design that the foundation and some of the other groups will also get some updates. Uh, we'll continue to talk with Danny Schlitt and Parks and Rec, um, ESC. I was, I was going to mention that at the end. So, so Monday night is a huge night for us, and it doesn't start till 9 o'clock, I think. Um, what, 9.30? 9.15. So we're meeting with Planning Commission, Architectural Review, and Tree, and tree Commission uh, to share. And so we've got um, our architects are coming and they're going to be sharing some of that information. So we'll, we'll continue to put it out. Our website will continue to be updated. Um, so please go on there. If you have questions, um, uh, new uh, GMHS at FCCPS.org. You can continue to ask questions. We'll continue to answer those questions. If you have questions today and just want to leave them on the cards, uh, we're happy to take those. Um, but we want to continue to uh, work through this. But our most important uh, group that we're going to talk to now are our teachers to find out now what are the, how do these spaces function. If you're a chemistry teacher, what does this chemistry lab really need to look like? And also doing quite a bit of student engagement as well. All right, well listen, I want to thank you for coming out on Sunday afternoon uh, to hear about, I hope you're as excited as I am. Um, and we welcome all of your comments, your questions, please send them in. And uh, our next Sunday series um, has yet to be determined because we're getting into the holiday season. Um, but as I understand it, we'll probably have one in December, just not sure when. Um, so look for it and thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much.